Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on a perfect Florida December morning. You know, the trend continues where I just can't complain about the weather. I would be a hypocrite to do so. Not gonna do it. It's just perfect. We're in the mid 60s right now. No humidity to speak of. I looked at the weather report. It's gonna be like this for the foreseeable future, at least for 10 days. And uh, I just have no complaints at all. But you know, this is not new. Naples in the winter is generally a lovely place. And I only get very upset when we have this, you know, hotter than usual weather, or you know, the weather guy comes out, oh, we're, you know, unusually warm days. Man, that's enough to make me want to stab people to death. But when it's just as it should be with, you know, highs in the 70s, lows in the high 50s or early 60s, it's the place to be. And that's the way it is right now. And uh, that's why I'm not complaining. I'd be crazy to do so. You know, it, we still have a fair amount of season left. It could get hot. It could get miserable. It probably will. Uh, but if I'm lucky this time around, I'm going to be the hell out of here when summer comes. But we'll get into that some other day. Uh, today I've got a 1987 Mercedes-Benz 560 SEC. This is a car from Dave the Wholesaler. Very nice guy. Known him for years. Love him to death. Uh, you know, not obviously in a romantic way. Well, okay, you know, he once did get me an El Dorado that I loved and I had inklings then. But uh, but anyway, he's a hell of a nice guy and he gives me cars to review. Uh, this one he gave me the other day. I'm very happy to have it. I know some of you guys out there are groaning at the thought of another 80s Mercedes. <laughs> I know, I know. I've, You know, look, I've done a fair share of of 126s, but um, I haven't done any coupes. And the coupe is far and away my favorite W126. I used to say it was the 300 SE, but uh, truly it is the coupe. And uh, we'll get into that in a moment. It's gonna be a short take because obviously I can link to the many detailed reviews on these cars I've done. Uh, but I'm gonna close out the 126 review board, uh, review mission with, uh, with a coupe. And I think that's the way to go. Uh, deer, back on the street. I only got a glimpse of them today. There's just a, I might put a brief clip of what I got. They, yeah, the forward facing eyes, car carnivorous deer that, that inhabit Peter's street. Uh, I just feel like one day they're gonna jump over the fence when I'm not looking and take me out like a pack of coyotes. But um, Apparently not today, which is good. I think I also heard gunshots this morning, like real, you know, AK-47 style rapid fire, you know, fast as you can pull the trigger kind of shit. Uh, so we'll see if there's any news stories later on, but uh, definitely a strange morning here in Petey, uh, Peter's drive. <laughs> Petey, he'd like that. And here's another thing about his driveway. Okay, there's a couple tennis balls, which I understand. That could be anywhere, and tennis balls are universal. But he's got a baseball sitting here that I found. An absolute honest-to-God baseball, and that's pretty friggin' weird. I mean, it's like finding a schnitzel in the yard of those Duck Dynasty people. Uh, it's the last thing I would have expected to find in Peter's driveway, and yet there it is. So I'll have to quiz him about that later. Uh, also, my nephew, the snowflake, is back for Christmas break. I have him back working at the shop. You know, he's a good kid, there's no question about that, but he's just absolutely full of critiques and advice. And I mean, he's done nothing. He's done nothing. But he has all sorts of critiques and advice. And it just seems like snowflakes today have the same almost genetic unearthed, unearned self-esteem that uh, like my friend Chris does. You know Chris, the worst human being on earth. And I mean that. I, You know, I talk a lot of shit. There's no question about that. And I say bad things about people. When I say that Chris is the worst human on earth, it's true. I can back it up with evidence. And, you know, if we ever have a conversation, I can definitely lay it out there like Perry Mason and uh, absolutely prove it. But it seems like snowflakes have that same... 
sort of ego that uh, that Chris does, and it's an absolute mystery where it comes from. Uh, but we'll see if any of the advice or critiques I take to heart, or we try something out on new on the videos. But um, you know, for the moment, I'm just kind of writing it off in my head. Also, Dalton, if you remember Dalton, he stopped by this last weekend. Uh, I can't say it was great to see him. I can't, you know, he showed up out of the blue, making all kinds of loud noises. Uh, showed up on some kind of new fancy Harley Davidson, uh, and apparently he's made one and only one payment on, and that's all he intends to make. Uh, when I, they said they, you know, for some reason they, re yeah, he comes up with these stories. So uh, you know, he started at uh, X payment dollars, then they found out he had bad credit, and they raised his payment. Well, I mean that doesn't sound like any finance contract I've ever seen, but, you know, apparently it's the one they gave him. And also, apparently, Harley-Davidson Financial would write a loan for a golden retriever, you know, if it uh, if it looked up and up enough. Uh, he showed up, and after, like, a 30-second conversation, he just kind of sat there and stared at me while I edited a video. Uh, it was really fucking unnerving, honestly, to have him sit there with that smirky look, wearing his... MC leather jacket, like the twisted nitwits or whatever the hell club he's in. And, uh, and he just stared at me and it was creepy as hell. And, you know, I was very honestly thrilled when he took off. Uh, not that I dislike the guy or anything, but, you know, there are just times when you just don't want to have someone around, particularly someone who just sort of stares at you blankly. And uh, before I get into the car, I just want to go over real quick the insane and aggressive drivers that are around me all the time. There was a douchebag in a Tahoe this morning tailgating me in the right lane, by the way, of a surface street heading over to Peter's at like 5.20 in the morning. I mean, apparently he wasn't early enough. He was in a big rush. Apparently there was someone next to me in the left lane. He couldn't get by him. So he decides to park himself three inches off the bumper and start waving his hands around. And by the way, I was doing like 58 and a 45. And I just think it's an absolute sign of the impending apocalypse, or at least the decline of the American empire. I mean, it's not just Korean cars anymore, or BMWs, it's even Nissans, it's everything. It's all of the cars. And I see it more and more from Teslas, by the way, of which there's a shitload running around here, uh, either piloted by sort of desperate older men hoping to look cool or, you know, hipster 40-something women praying to God that the pool boy will find them attractive. I mean, it's just a weird setup. And I, I give us 50 years, tops, tops. And it could be as few as 10 or 20 before the whole thing just goes right into the toilet. I used to think that I'd outlive the end of it all, but I don't think so anymore. And frankly, that's why someday, very soon, I'm going to be in the mountains with a rifle, a beard, and a motorhome. And I'll be very, very happy that way. But anyway, look, I'm, I'm digressing. Obviously, this isn't, uh, you know, beneficial to a short car review. So we're going to jump right in this thing. And today, I again have this 126 Coupe, uh, this being a 1987 560 SEC. And when you see it on Bring a Trailer, you're going to want to check it out because it's really one of the best ones that I've seen in a long time, or at least one of the best preserved ones. 40,000 miles on this thing and a pretty cool color combo. Not exactly the way I'd want want to own one, but um, but a very, very nice one. And if you're going to look for one that you want to do something with, it's a great starting point. Uh, and if you want one you just sort of clean up and put away, this is a great deal too. Uh, and it's quite possibly my favorite car. Um, I say that, you know, it may not be, but it, it's certainly up there. It's certainly top five. And if you told me I had to pick one car that I'd have to drive for the rest of my life, this would probably be it uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, it's just an amazing, amazing machine. In its time, it was the pinnacle of engineering. And 
Beyond that, in coupe form, it was an absolute indicator of personal wealth, even more so than the sedans. And today, it's a highly drivable classic uh, that's really rewarding and sort of fun to own. Um, it's probably best remembered in pop culture for Roadhouse. You know, the sedans were everywhere on TV and the movies. The coupes were a little more rare. Uh, also rarer in production. But uh, man, did the coupe stand out in Roadhouse. If you remember that, he drove that shitbox old Riviera, which now I'd give my eye teeth for, by the way, uh, because he didn't want anyone screwing with his Mercedes, which he kept under a cover, you know, in storage. And it was a 560 SEC. Uh, I thought it was a little goofy looking with the wheels and the bad ride height. Uh, but uh, it did have that Mercedes. I mean, you know when he fires it up and they show the odometer and it's got like 3,000 miles and the sound and the look and the feel. Uh, even in that movie, you could sort of feel the quality and beauty of the 560 SEC. And it's a car that I've owned personally. Uh, I also had an 87, maybe it was an 88. Uh, and I traded... Um, I remember I bought it, it was a little bit rough around the edges. Uh, a friend of mine is a very high-end painter. He's a miserable, nasty person, horrible, horror. You know, describes himself as schizophrenic, delusional, and homicidal, and that's all true, by the way. Um, he, he would famously hand people big wrenches and tell them they were gonna need that to defend themselves. But anyway, I treated him a first-generation Acura Legend with a five-speed, a coupe that I had bought and actually it was a sedan now that I remember. Uh, it basically almost had window cranks, it was so base. I loved that thing, but I loved the SEC more. And uh, I traded it to him to do a big high-end paint job on the car, which he did. And uh, it was stunning. I think I have a picture of it somewhere, which I'll throw in now. Um, I ran it with these 18-inch AMG monoblock wheels, which are probably the best-looking wheel ever made, in my humble opinion. And uh, I did have to lower the front end, because uh, Mercedes, to adhere to U.S. bumper laws, had to raise the front end on these coupes. You can see it on this one a little bit. It seems more pronounced on some than others, but uh, on that particular car, the front end looked like it looked like you took the engine out and the springs were lifted the front end like a foot in the air. Uh, so I had to chop the springs, put it down, and that thing looked great. Uh, but of course, you know, back then, even now, I went broke over some reason and uh, had to sell it. And it's just one of the deep regrets of my life that that car ever went away. I really wish I could find it back. And, uh, you know, there it is. This review is going to read like a love letter, and I don't care. It's my channel. I don't even care if you're tired of 126s. I've got a 126 coupe, and I'm happy to have it. I haven't had one ever in a video, so we're going to knock this one out. And um, I'll just say this. Look, I consider this car to be the last and best of old guard Mercedes German engineering. It's probably the finest analog car ever made. Um, one could argue the Cayman that came out, you know, for Porsche years later might be. Fine, but the Cayman was sort of an accident. This is not. This, this was the pinnacle of real post-World War II traditional German engineering. It's just an absolute masterpiece. Uh, it was marketed as the second generation of the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Uh, the W116, the generation that came before this, was the first official S-Class. This was the second. And uh, that stands for Special Class or uh, Sonder Class. And um, these were manufactured in sedan, form from, you know, in Europe, 79 through 1990, in America, 80 through 91. Uh, the coupe form didn't come out till later, 81 it came out in Europe, probably 82 here. And uh, it was just a much better car uh, than the one that it replaced. And that's no accident. I mean, it had a long production run. It was really long in the tooth by the time they killed it. Uh, from, uh, what was it, like 12 years or something, 13 years. Uh, and they made 818,000 sedans, but only 74,000 coupes. So a grand total of just under 900,000 of these were made, which makes it the most prolific S-Class uh, ever made, by the way, the most successful. And I think that's a record that's going to stand. I mean, 
it's hard to describe just how impactful this car was in the 80s, how important it was to our sort of booming pop culture. If you remember the 80s with Reagan and money and Wall Street and yuppies and having money and being successful was kind of in and uh, was in the movies and TV. And when you were successful, when you were uh, you know, finally at the top of your game and make it the big income. This is what you bought. I mean, uh, there were Audis, there were BMWs, you know, they were invisible and American luxury at the time. I mean, it, 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 this thing compared to that, it must have looked like the DeLorean Michael J. Fox took back to 1955. I mean, you put this next to a 1983 Cadillac, and I like 83 Cadillacs, by the way, but it's a joke. It's like they're from different planets and different time zones. I mean, there was just no comparison uh, to the way this car was back then and how impactful it was and how people looked at it and thought of it. And uh, that that sales record, I think, is just something that will never be broken. I mean, you've got these plastic, fantastic S-classes today. Mercedes doesn't build anything like this anymore because they can't. They couldn't afford. I mean, this thing cost like, in today dollars, this car would have been like 180 grand. I mean, we're talking about a whole different world. Um, you know, the designers, they wanted the 126 to be the unquestionable champion in areas of safety, technology, efficiency. Uh, aerodynamics played a huge role in the design and they managed to put it all together. And they started early. Uh, for a car that came out again in 79 in Europe, they actually started designing it in 73. Uh, so they had plenty of time, but they knew they'd need it because this is when Mercedes was trying to make the finest car in the world. And I mean, it sounds cliched, but that was their true motivational factor. They wanted to make something that was just above and beyond anything else being made. And I think they succeeded. And uh, again, that's why, and again, look, I'm a GM guy. I love Camaros and Firebirds and Chevelles. But I can't deny what this car is and what it was and you know how it advanced the entire automotive industry forward uh, the way that it did. It was just that important of a car. Uh, there were two incarnations of 126. There was early and late. Um, the early one's attractive, but the second, you know, redesign, whatever you call it, refresh from 85 on in Europe, 86 on here uh, through 91, was stunning and I think it just became automotive perfection. Um, it, it was Bruno Sacco, he's sort of a German-Italian guy, famous Mercedes designer, and this was his absolute masterpiece. Uh, you know, he designed cars before and after, but this is the one that he truly is most famous for, and uh, with good reason. And it's probably the Italian roots uh, that he was able to take this stodgy car companies stuff and turn it into something that actually is a you know it's subtle but it's as gorgeous as any curved Italian car out there in its own way the subtlety is part of the beauty of the car I mean even today it's fresh and current and timeless you know it you look at it now and yeah it looks old I mean it's an old Mercedes but it's very pleasing to the eye very attractive to look at and it's a design that is aimed uh, aged with absolute tired tirelessness I mean it's just a gorgeous gorgeous car to look at I'm biased maybe you don't agree but you know it's the way that I see it and BMW's Audi's Cadillac's everything else was just invisible next to it uh, they were driven by CEOs doctors lawyers bankers third world dictators other heads of state at least outside America uh, you'd see any number of sedans parked outside embassies which you still do today uh, gangsters drug dealers uh, even the Pope had a uh, 126. I mean, it's just one of those cars that became synonymous with the high end of life and uh, the coupes particularly because, again, you didn't buy one of these unless you were just absolutely loaded. You could buy a sedan and, you know, it could have been for livery. It could have been for uh, any number of the tools. It, it basically, it's a tool. The coupe, nah, 
that's just, you know, showing off your wealth. If you drove one, if you drove an S-Class Coupe, you had made it. And uh, it was masculine, impactful, and car enough to be driven by Clint Eastwood even today. I think I can search the web and find a photo of him driving an S-Class Coupe, one that he's owned since new, I'm sure, and uh, still drives to this day. And if look, if Clint Eastwood's driving one of these things, you know you're going to be fine. It's just an absolute simplicity, uh, sorry, an absolute symphony of simplicity and quality and subtle high-end engineering and true old-fashioned German wood bolts, nuts, bolts, metal, wood, leather, all put together in a way that is so solid, it's, you know, might as well be an anvil. I mean, it's just, anyway, there it is. There's the love letter to this car. Um, but, you know, again, there were no accountants and Mercedes. This, I mean, they, they, obviously they had them, but they were just kept in a dungeon below, you know, the, the lower levels. They, they weren't really ruling the day the way they are today. This car was built to a standard and not a cost. It was, again, they, they did not care what it would end up being priced at. That wasn't the point. They had to build the finest car. And uh, that, I believe, is what they did. So I know I'm gushing about this thing, but uh, what can I tell you? I just absolutely love it. Uh, you can see the aerodynamics of it. Uh, had a very low drag efficient for its time. Um, it had frame. It had perfect proportions. Frameless glass. Uh, just an absolutely gorgeous car. But I tell you what. Okay, so let's do a quick history. So 1987. I was a kid, by the way, 16 years old. I was driving my Firebird street racing it. Uh, the only time I saw cars like this were, you know, cruising around fancier parts of Naples or in the movies. They weren't really in my wheelhouse then. Uh, they became so later, but, you know, much, much later. Uh, but what was going on? What was happening in 1987 uh, when the masters of the universe were driving cars like this around? Well, the first Simpsons show emerged on the Tracy Ullman show. Probably the most important news of 1987. Uh, it was a short, it was, you know, Homer looked and talked weird, but uh, there it was. And that, of course, became an American institution, uh, you know, beyond almost any pop culture thing we've had since. Uh, a kid named Matthias Rust, he was a young guy, West German, flew a small Cessna into Moscow and landed in Red Square. Uh, ended up getting arrested, you know, it was part of some clever protest against who knows what and uh, was very, very big news at the time. Um, a ferry, <coughs> a ferry capsized outside the, uh, the harbor of uh, Zeebrugge, I can't say it very well, but Bel a Belgian ferry, 193 people dead. I can't remember if that's the one where they left the front cargo door open or not. Uh, but either way, it didn't work out and a lot of people drowned. Uh, Ronald Reagan delivered his famous speech at the Berlin Wall. Uh, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, that one. Uh, so he was running around back then. Uh, the Disney Corporation in France agreed to create an amusement park. You know, big news at the time. Interesting that the French government was involved. Um, you'd think it would be all private enterprise, but yeah, I guess France is kind of socialist. But anyway, there they did. Uh, a guy named Terry Waite, who was, um, I think he was like a special envoy of the Archbishop of Canterbury or something in Lebanon. He was kidnapped in Beirut and that became uh, just absolute national news until he was released a, a while later. So that was uh, that was a big thing at the time. Uh, there was a stock market crash in 87, of course, October. Uh, 5,008 point drop that, you know, sent people scrambling. Uh, and interest rates were high back then. They were also in the 8% like they are now. They had come down quite a bit, uh, you know, over the past few years, but they were still high. Uh, the first criminal was convicted using DNA evidence. That happened in England. I'm sure that got appealed. Um, and work on the Channel Tunnel started over there as well. They started digging that hole between uh, England and France, which of course is a thing now. Uh, Prozac debuted in the United States. <sighs> probably a good thing and probably has, you know, saved us a few more years on our ultimate decline. And uh, televangelist Jim Baker, if you remember him, uh, he was screwing, what's her name, uh, Jessica Hahn, the church secretary, who was pretty hot, I have to say. 
And uh, that came out, that became a big scandal. And then they started investigating him. It looked like he misused ministry funds for you know, a variety of revolting things and actually ended up in jail. Uh, at the movies, you'd see stuff like Stakeout, Lethal Weapon, uh, Robocop, uh, great movie, by the way, Fatal Attraction, which always was a bit creepy. I think women were pissed off that they finally made a stalking movie and it was, you know, a chick that was going after people with boiled bunnies and daggers, but yeah, it seemed appropriate at the time. Uh, TV-wise, you had The Cosby Show. <sighs> Back when old Bill was riding high, unlike today. Uh, Dynasty, people absolutely went nuts for that. Falcon Crest, its competitor. Uh, Cheers, you know, great old show. Family Ties uh, and Remington Steel. These were all big TV shows in 87. Music, you had Michael Jackson, uh, Bad, the album came out. You had Bruce Hornsby and The Range. Uh, U2 was still doing their stuff. George Michael with Faith. Uh, Whitney Houston was hanging around doing whatever it is she did. And uh, Brian Adams. So there it is. That's the stuff that was going on in 1987 when this car was new and tooling around and um, you know how far we've come since then so I'm gonna break for a minute uh, have a little more coronavirus Basil Hayden and um, yeah moved on you know look it's usually Jack Daniels but I ended up with this stuff for some reason it's nice stuff and uh, it's you know gonna help me get through the video uh, when I come back we're gonna dive into the styling and look of this particular car and uh, keep the ball rolling so bear with me one moment All right, so let's have a look at the design of this thing. And again, many 126s have I done, but this is the first coupe, and uh, I'm so happy to be doing it. The front end is absolutely beautiful. You can see in the grill, it's got a big star. Uh, and on top of the hood, it's got just a little badge. Of course, that would be different from every other 126 at the time, which had a big hood star, hood ornament. Well, uh, the coupes were meant to be more sporty. You know, not really a sports car. To call it that would be inaccurate. It's way too heavy and, you know, chunky for that. But it is certainly a grand touring car uh, made out of what should be a big four-door sedan. Uh, you see the tri-pointed star leading the way that stands for German domination of land, sea, and air. The perfect grill ornament for, you know, a car like this. Uh, this one being one of the later ones, it has that lower ca cladding, uh, you know, the Sacco cladding, which just absolutely brought this design to life and made it look much more modern which you wouldn't have thought possible considering how modern they already looked against other cars, but it did, and more aerodynamic. Uh, you can see they hid the wipers behind a little upturn at the back of the hood. Um, and again, it doesn't wow you with swoops and curves and radical design, but if you look close, the attention to detail, I mean, there's four different subtle body lines just in the hood alone, and uh, two more on the side of the car. Uh, a third one right before you hit the cladding. Everywhere you look on this car, there's just sort of these subtle, beautiful body lines. Long hood, low slung, slight decline on it uh, as it goes forward. Kind of a stubby higher tail, uh, you know, nice little short deck. Um, almost looks like a German Chevelle, if you will. And uh, the frameless glass that it has sort of adds to that. You know, that wasn't really a thing uh, in American cars at this point, but the Germans kept it alive. And what that means is these uh, windows here on the side go down front and back without frames around them. So when you open it up, you have a giant hole on the side of your car, uh, you know, almost um, very much like the 60s and very early 70s American stuff where, uh, you know, you could do that. Uh, the door handles on the coupes, they were their own thing, and I don't entirely understand them, to be quite frank. They're enormous needlessly so to my end. I mean, I suppose there's an aerodynamic aspect to them with that big leading end, but uh, they're the color of the cladding and they're completely different from the door handles and every other 126. Uh, they also matched the mirror covers to the uh, cladding, which is a good look. Uh, nice, I won't call it flush glass, but you know, sort of flush. Uh, sort of a delicate aluminum chromey trim around it, which 
um, I've never been a big fan of because it's easy to damage and hard to restore, but uh, it does look nice, subtle, and adds a bit of elegance to the car uh, in the, you know, in the way that chrome does, even if it's not chrome per se. Uh, they had these flat 15-inch aero wheels, which came into play in 86 onward. Uh, they were uh, upgraded from the earlier bunt wheels. They were, again, very aerodynamic for the time. And uh, they're chrome on this car, which I'm not a huge fan of. I'd probably go back to the silver ones. Uh, the chrome ones were not factory. They would have been added by a dealer or ordered by a guy who owned it to sort of dress it up. And, uh, yeah, some people like it. Yeah, I don't know. I probably did back then, but I'd go silver now. Uh, but the cladding, absolutely lovely. Beautiful, perfect greenhouse on this car. The car that replaced it, the W140, uh, that was one of Bruno Sacco's laments. He said he got the greenhouse screwed up on that thing because there was some internal fighting over it. Uh, he wanted it lower. They made him make it taller to accommodate, you know, basketball players. Not so on this car. He got it absolutely perfect. I love the swooping angular C-pillar at the back, the angled glass at the back. Uh, again, swooping into that short deck lid. Uh, you get around to the back, you can see the lovely bits of chrome trim around the trunk and the top of the bumper. Uh, being a true import, you know, back in the 80s, yeah, it was a U.S. model car, but it's truly at its heart a German car that they just did U.S. stuff to make it legal here and because there was money here. But you can see that the area between the taillights is made for a European-style license plate, and the U.S. plate looks awkward. The way it sort of, uh, you know, if you had a Euro plate on here, it wouldn't come below this body line, and it wouldn't be right up against that uh, push button. It just would be absolutely you know, fitting the way it should. On the American versions, you can just tell that the plate isn't the one that the car was designed for. You got twice pipes coming out there on the left-hand side. And, uh, you know, again, just sort of this lovely, subtle curvature everywhere uh, that is just so very German. <laughs> really does work beyond description on this car. So uh, let's have a look inside the trunk. I think I need the key for that. No, we got it open. All right, so you can see back here, Always interesting to me that they didn't finish the underneath. They were always gray. They weren't body color. Eh, why? Don't know. Don't know if it even matters. Uh, there you see the original floor mats. You see it's a nice size trunk. Um, you put plenty of crap in there, including whatever toddlers you're carrying around or, uh, you know, a bunch of Claymore mines, MP5 machine guns, Uzis, whatever it is your average S-Class driver at the time. I guess the Pope would have had a robes in there and such, and a third world dictator probably would have kept a couple of slaves in there, or soccer players who didn't win the World Cup trials. Uh, but anyway, nice big trunk, very proper, well finished, body, interior body color, and uh, as it should be. And that a close. And again, that lovely uh, pointed star. Mercedes nomenclature back at the time made sense, unlike today. I mean, nomenclature makes no sense. They have electric Porsches that are called turbos, you know? Tell me that's not friggin' awkward. But uh, 560 SEC is very simple. So 560 stands for engine size, which is 5.6 liter. Actually, I think it's 5.5 in this car, so maybe we're not perfect, but close enough. Uh, S for the special class, E for Ein Spritzung or fuel injection or whatever the hell it is. C for coupe, it would have been L on the long wheelbase sedans. There would have been nothing after the E on the short wheelbase sedans. And uh, again, the nomenclature at the time made sense. And it was nice and German and European and stood out. Back when Cadillacs were still called DeVilles and Eldorados, everyone had their own identity. Now Cadillacs and all these other companies have adopted this sort of Teutonic nomenclature and it just has become absolutely meaningless and stupid to me uh, and it's a goddamn shame. Uh, third brake light, that was a thing. You can see it was kind of an add-on back then. 
Uh, in 86, America passed that law where every car had to have that center brake light, and, um, and there it is. Everyone raced out to get one on their earlier cars. Uh, you can see those ridge taillights. Those are made so when snow or mud gets on them, it doesn't get all the way on the inside ridges, so you're still able to see the lights, you know, from behind, and eh, just crafty German engineering. Uh, all right, we'll have a look under the hood, which, by the way, is not easy to do in this car, so... I don't know where I'm going to put the camera. But anyway, listen to this. Bank vault. Uh, the way that door closes is just absolutely incredible. I only set the camera down for a minute. It's a two-hand affair to open this hood. Oh, God. You know, at this age, everything hurts. Friggin' everything hurts all the time. Anyway, the sedans you'd get a wide variety of engines in, much, much wider than in the coupes, which frankly always just had the high-end engine. Uh, before 86, it would have the 500 engine. You could get the 380 SEC in America, which was the top-of-the-line V8 at the time. Uh, but otherwise, that's it. You never got anything but the big V8 under the... Uh, under the hood of the coupes, uh, you know, we, that was available. There were no six-cylinder coupes. There were no diesel coupes. Uh, this is an M117. Uh, it was America's answer to the 500. Uh, back then, and then very quickly, there was a 500 motor in Europe, but it didn't come out here until 85. So from 81 to 84, the, the best engine we could get here was the 380. So a bunch of guys started gray market importing uh, the 500s to America. And of course, this drove the American dealers insane. So America, you know, got some, they bored out the five liter, uh, the 500 motor to a 5.6, and they sold it in America and then didn't sell it in Europe. So then a bunch of 560s went in the other direction. This weird Mercedes shit. Uh, but anyway, M117 had 275 horse in Europe. Uh, which was less restricted then, which is kind of a fascinating reversal. Uh, 238 horsepower here in the more restricted American form. 317 foot-pounds there, like 272 foot-pounds here. Uh, but either way, it was a very, very peppy engine for 86 onward and made the car much, much quicker than many of its contemporaries and more power. I remember when these came out, you know, you think of 270 or 240 horsepower now, was kind of a joke. Back then it was serious and uh, these cars felt fast. Uh, but anyway, you see under the hood everything sort of as it should be. There's the ABS. That was a, I won't call it pioneered by Mercedes because there were earlier ABS systems of different varieties, but in its modern form, uh, Mercedes pioneered ABS and the crumble zones and the um, the airbags and, you know, a variety of different um, uh, patents on forward moving stuff was part of this car. Uh, a tremendous amount of them. Uh, this car was just an absolute pioneer. Four-speed automatic, electronically controlled, four-wheel independent suspension, four-wheel disc brakes. Uh, traction control was another thing that was pioneered on these cars. And uh, just an absolute German masterpiece under the hood. So, tell you what, I'm going to pause it there, get this hood back down, get my crap inside the trunk, and then we're going to hop in and go for a spin. So, hold on just one moment. All right, so let's fire this thing up and go for a spin. Uh, have a look inside first anyway. So, you can see in here, and again, you know, I know I keep, uh, I just keep, loving on this car, but I can't help it. I just can't help it. What a fantastic analog setup this car is inside. Wood, nuts, bolts, leather, fine materials, none of the wow shit that you get today with the LED lighting accents and, and scents coming out of the glove box and 20 different computer screens and all the stuff that snowflakes demand. This is just pure 
elegant, lovely, well-engineered simplicity. And the luxury comes from the fine materials, the craftsmanship, the engineering, and uh, of course the very subtle touches. Um, if you look in the back, your Canadians are going to be pretty damn chipper. Uh, being a coupe, it has basically two seats uh, with a uh, little spot in the middle to put your MP5 or, you know, whatever other little gun any gangster might need in there. You got a little center armrest. I'm not going to lean back there and kill myself, but you can see the cross there. That's the uh, factory Mercedes uh, medical kit, you know, anything a wounded German might need on the road and uh, everything looking nice and proper. I haven't taken that off. Interestingly, it's got one of those advanced auto parts pads on the rear seat belt. So somebody must have been using that seat a lot. This guy probably had some Canadian friends and neighbors. A uh, big ashtray in the center there. And uh, I suppose this is what you, you know, would have used to make your way to a Mannheim steamroller concert or something in the 80s. Uh, beautiful big bucket seats, incredibly comfortable. You know, you can take a 400 mile trip and it feels like you just went around the store. And that's the kind of Mercedes stuff that they had then. Uh, I love the haptic switches. That was a new thing for them uh, at the time. Brilliantly engineered. Not on the side of the seat, not in a weird spot, but in the shape of a seat where you want it. It has a power headrest, which was always cool back then, and uh, just looks great. Uh, this uh, perforation here on the door panel, uh, it emanates whatever air you happen, you know, if you got heat, heat's coming in there. If you got air conditioning, it's coming in there. And it just emanates from that to sort of make you feel more comfortable. Uh, I love a car that has three door pin switches. So uh, there's some over engineering for you. But the quality of the materials, the fit and finish, the way it all goes together, absolute perfect Mercedes stuff. Nice big map popping there. And uh, I tell you what I'm going to do. I have to... This side is not operative. It's something I'm sure Dave will have fixed before it goes on Bring a Trailer, but it's got these terrific seatbelt presenters. Uh, not working on that side, but let's have a look on it over at the passenger side. Yeah, there, you can see it. So, there it is going back in. Brilliant stuff, again, new at the time, almost robotic. See the way it comes out. Uh, and presented the seatbelt to you in a way that made it easy to grab so you didn't have to stretch behind you. Very, very cool uh, Mercedes engineering in the 80s. I'm going to sit inside and see what we got. Again, the door closing with that thud. Uh, you got a beautiful, elegant, very simple instrument cluster, 170 mile an hour speedo in front of you, uh, tack over on the right, little clock, uh, vacuum operated economy gauge, which is a joke, <laughs> a joke, uh, water temp there on the left, uh, oil pressure on the right, there's four gauges in one, and of course your fuel gauge in the middle. Uh, you see the hieroglyphics on uh, the uh, stocks are all nice, very low mileage example at 46,000, cruise control, wipers, nice, your classic Mercedes light switch there, uh, you know, beautiful use of burl wood, lovely, you know, each one sort of signed and initialed on the back by the guy who made it, uh, big switch panel of German hieroglyphics here with rear defrost, air recirculation, hazards, antenna, interior light, and automatic climate control. And of course, a uh, Becker Grand Prix stereo that's completely indecipherable. Let's see what we got on the radio. We have static on the radio. That's wonderful. All right, so anyway, you got some static there. Uh, this one had heated uh, seats, has the country horn set up. Um, that's kind of interesting. So you honk like now, get a proper honk, engage it, and you get this light little honk, which, you know, I guess you could use for courtesy stuff or, you know, whatever reason. The nice big wood center console here with more, uh, your power mirrors on the passenger side only because, you know, your driver, you're right there, you don't need it. And uh, more window switches and such, nice big armrest. 
in here you got a glove box later became an airbag uh, if you're having a picnic I guess you could use those as cup holders but if you're driving obviously that's not gonna work nice big set of books and other crap and everything lovely get up here you've got a day night mirror that you engage yourself you've got these big lovely lit up cocaine mirrors with a little center one in case the Sun happens to be there uh, you got a nice giant power sunroof I mean that is a big sucker and when you open up all the windows and that sunroof it's almost like you're in a convertible so I saw Robert the German pull in just now and I need to talk to him about a car that he's fixing for me so uh, let me quickly pause there for a minute then we're gonna come back hop in this thing and uh, go for a drive so uno momento all right back and at it so let's fire up that big 5.5 liter v8 it runs so you know again the, you're completely isolated from the engine with the uh, amount of sound deadening they used the advanced engine mounts uh, you know, I know Lexus came out in 1990 and had the champagne glasses on the hood. Well, this is what they were aiming for when they did that. I mean, this thing is virtually silent inside. And, of course, all the windows seal great. And, you know, again, nobody builds cars like this anymore. This was just a very special moment in time. And it's a classic car. I mean, this thing is what... 13 36 years old and it's a car you could still daily drive it's got uh, recirculating ball steering which feels very you know it's not uber responsive but it's very very smooth and of course that's uh that's the key. It's got a nice smooth shifting transmission, uh, no vibration in the steering wheel at all. Uh, this is new enough to have an airbag. That would have come out in 85 in Mercedes, I think. And again, sort of leading the way on that one. Nice leather wrap, uh, of course, in the higher end coupe. And uh, the thing just goes down the road. It's nice to have one with such low miles that, you know, probably has also been maintained because it just goes down the road so smooth. And you get this feel for or, again, how it would have felt to be one of these masters of the universe, you know, driving your essentially $180,000 car, I think 70 something back then, but 180 today, and feeling like you're the master of everything around you. And of course, this thing was designed for the Autobahn uh, at the time, so it's meant to, you know, drive you to the town next over at 140 miles an hour with, you know, the kind of smoothness listening to, you know, Wagner or whatever it is the Germans listen to, uh, you know, and hearing a pin drop. It's just, uh, again, I know this is a bit of a love story of a review, but this car just has the ticket to my heart. It looks like Peter's kid must be doing all of these burnouts here on the end of the street. Somebody's a delinquent anyway. All right, let's get out of here and try not to get in front of that dump truck. Now, of course, it's a classic car now that not only looks great, is actually reasonable to maintain because there's many, many parts out there that are still available. And it's a car you can daily drive. Uh, you know, you don't feel like you're in something old and tired. I mean, it's got a very modern lovely ride to it and you feel like you could take it on a trip across the country the seats are comfy it's got good air conditioning you got an airbag you got abs brakes uh, because the car was so advanced um, it has all of these features that you know didn't come out on other cars until you know a fair amount of time later and uh, again that's part of the joy to me of owning and driving one of these things today uh, as a classic car they made almost a million 126s so there's lots of used parts out there they're still being used in earnest around the world not just as collectibles but you know you pull up in front of the mongolian embassy you'll probably see a 126 that's still being run so there's all kinds of new parts still out there and uh, you know even if the bits of the trim or you know other things are kind of hard to find now you can't get them anymore um, there's still a tremendous amount of parts available from Mercedes for this car not just aftermarket suppliers <laughs> I 
just kicked down. <laughs> it was my grow house. Oh god, I need to aim this thing at Wes Bradley's house and come in afterwards and start ripping throats out. Anyway, there it is. Amazing car. Really happy to have gotten one. Many thanks to Dave the Wholesaler. And um, there it is. Keep an eye on Bring a Trailer if you have an interest. Uh, this is a very nice piece. Very fun to drive. Uh, gonna have some more stuff coming up. I think I have a 69 Camaro on the way towards the end of the week. Uh, be good to get one of those knocked out. And uh, otherwise, we'll keep the ball rolling. So, thanks very much for having a look. Appreciate it. And we will see you with the next one. Take care.